Good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. So it was mid-April 2012, and I was serving at a church in Atlanta, and I was on the verge of calling an emergency staff meeting. And the reason I was calling this meeting was because the senior pastor who was serving our church at that time abruptly resigned, um, and I was now charged to figure out what we do next. He, he resigned on a Sunday, finished his sermon, communicated to the church that he was going to be done, and didn't come back to the office the next day, and just cleared out his office in the evenings, middle of the next week. So I go into this staff meeting, and because of some decisions that he had made during his one year he had served with us, um, our staff went from six individuals to two individuals. So this emergency staff meeting was really a conversation between me and the only other person left on staff. It was our children's ministry director. And so the agenda for the staff meeting is just simply, wh what do we do next? How do we respond? How do we move forward? Now, even though there was just the two of us on staff, there was a, a missionary that our church supported. We were actually his sending church, and he was on home assignment and had been on home assignment for about eight months or so. And so he was, part of his home assignment was just simply to serve his local church. So he did all sorts of things while he was with us. He helped out in the production booth. He helped out in kids and youth programs, taught classes if we needed him to. And so he, he and I were building a relationship and we're getting along really well. And so the elders had said, hey, since we're going through this transition, do you mind just being around the office, being a support, and just continuing to serve in any way we need? And she so was like, oh yeah, happy to, sure thing. So he shows up to this staff meeting, and the agenda, the first item on the agenda is what do we do next Sunday? Like, what is the plan for next Sunday? It was just the three of us. We didn't have a full-time worship director or anything, so we're like, we got to figure out who's going to lead worship. we got to figure out who's going to preach. And this guy's name was Jeff, and Jeff pipes up, and he goes, oh, I, I've, I've got the sermon covered. I was like, oh, really? Okay. He's like, yeah, the elders asked if I wouldn't mind preaching next Sunday, and I said I'd, I'd be happy to do it. The strangest thing happened in me at that moment when he said he was going to be preaching. In that moment, he went from being a friend to instantly becoming a threat to me. See, one of the other things that was true of his home assignment was that he was discerning what his next step in ministry would be. He was serving in Singapore at the time and was kind of discerning, are we going back to Singapore? Will God call us to another country? Or is there a chance that God might call us to do something different altogether ministry-wise? And so I was in a position thinking like, hey, with this opening at this church, I might step into the senior pastor role. And all of a sudden just found out like, this guy is my competition. And I began to think, what better way to influence the elder team, in the search committee, but by preaching on Sundays. So my very next thought was, I have to figure out how to get control of the preaching schedule. Because then I can put myself on really good Sundays, <laughs> and I can give him all the crummy Sundays where nobody's going to be there. And instantly, this guy, who I knew well, we were in a discipleship group together, was a friend, and all of a sudden became a threat. Anybody ever experienced that before? Any ever, anybody ever find that there's someone in some area of your life and their presence in that space all of a sudden just provokes all sorts of insecurity in you? It's like they walk into the room and the atmosphere and the environment in the room changes and shifts completely. It's like people notice them. People are drawn to them. They have this charisma. They know how to work a room, and people can't stop talking about them. It's like, oh, did you see what so-and-so did? Did you hear what so-and-so said? Do you notice what so-and-so has? And it's just like a buzz about them all the time. People who are coming to you for advice now go to that individual, and you're like, who is this person, and why do they seem to be following me around everywhere I go? And it seems like everything that they do just flourishes and thrives, and it's effortless. And even if you try and distance yourself from that individual, it's like they are always right there. I mean, anybody ever? Yeah. Sometimes those people just pop up 
and they highlight some insecurity in your life. And when you're able to process those moments objectively, you can recognize that your reaction comes from a place of insecurity, but when you're reacting out of insecurity and not aware, your thinking becomes irrational, right? You start to create this narrative in your head about that person. And that's what I did with this guy, Jeff. He's after my job. He wants to prove something that he's better than me. And who does he think he is? Sure, he was a missionary serving on the other side of the world. Maybe that makes him more holy, but I'm going to show him otherwise, right? Like all of that starts circling around in my head. Thinking is irrational. You slip into desperation, panic, grasping at straws. So anybody here have somebody come to mind as I'm saying all this? You don't, you don't have to raise your hand. But I wouldn't be surprised if there's somebody who pops in mind to you this morning. So the question is, when that happens, when you're around that person, how is it that you respond? And interestingly enough, the Christmas story captures reacting out of insecurity and threat. Oftentimes we think of the Christmas story as being this sentimental story. This cute, cuddly baby is born in a backyard barn with all these cute, cuddly farm animals, and there's angels in the sky, and it's bright, and its stars are shining, and it's like, oh, this is so wonderful. But for one individual in the Christmas story, the birth of Jesus is a threat, and it's a declaration of war because of the insecurity in their life. And then there are these other characters in the Christmas story that teach us how to respond and navigate through those moments when insecurity comes our way. And we find all of this in Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 verse 1 starts like this. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Now, of all the characters in the Christmas story, the Magi are the most mysterious, and their presence in the story raises all sorts of questions. Like, to begin with, who, who are these guys? Like, where did they come from? What does it mean that they are from the East, and where did they get the idea that a baby was going to be born king of the Jews, and that somehow a star was going to lead them to where this baby would be born? And then what happens once they leave Jerusalem? Because as Quickly and mysteriously, as they ride into the story, they ride out, and we never hear from them again. We have no real recollection of what impact they had in people's lives after they see Jesus. Now, some people wonder if the Magi were astrologers, and that's in part because of the question that they ask when they get to Jerusalem. They show up to Jerusalem in verse 2. It says, and asked, where is the one who is born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So somewhere along the way, if they were astrologers and if they did study stars, they noticed there was one peculiar star that kind of incited, oh, something different is happening in the world's history. We need to follow that star. But again, it raises another question, where in the world would they have learned that they should follow a star that would lead to the birth of a Jewish baby that would someday change the course of the world's history? Now, some scholars wonder that being from the East could be a reference to Babylon. And the way that these astrologers would have learned about this baby was while Israel was in exile in Babylon, they could have disclosed some of the scriptures, the Jewish scriptures to people in Babylon, and they could have heard or come across something like Numbers 24, verse 17, that says, Behold, a star will come from Jacob. Jacob is just another way to reference Israel because in the Old Testament, there was an individual whose name was Jacob that was later changed to Israel, and it was from him that the people of Israel came. So behold, a star will come from Jacob, and a scepter, which is a symbol of power, of royalty, of rule, will rise amongst Israel. So somewhere along the way, they have awareness that there's a star that's going to rise, it's going to be different and distinct than any other star that they've ever seen. 
and they should follow that star because it will lead them to who the true king of kings is. So the star appears, the magis follow, it leads them to Jerusalem, and we don't know who exactly they ask when they get there, but notice again their question. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? No matter who you were in Israel at that time, if somebody comes to you and asks that question, your immediate reaction is probably apprehension. Why? Because there already is one who is named king of the Jews. His name is Herod. Now, again, we're not told how it is that Herod hears this news, but I like to imagine that one of his servants who work in his royal court starts to hear this rumor about these three mysterious figures from the east who have come to visit this new baby who will be this new king of the Jews. And they go to, the, to Herod, and he's like, excuse me, your majesty, have you heard of this rumor going around? I thought you might want to know that there is a new king on the horizon, right? For everybody else in Israel, this has the potential to be really good news, except for Herod. A new king is only bad news to the one who is currently sitting as king. And in this story, Herod has three specific reactions to this moment. The first we see is in verse 3. When Herod, King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all of Jerusalem with him. Herod's first response is that he's disturbed. He's immediately on the defensive. Matthew, what Matthew demonstrates here is that the, the presence of Jesus challenges those who are in power. In part because those in power can easily allow that power to go to their heads. To think, I'm untouchable. I'm invincible, I can do what I want, and I can get away with anything. Jesus' presence to those in power also challenges their rule because Jesus' rule and reign is often very different than the, those who are in power in his day. Meaning Jesus' rule and reign is selfless. It's marked by justice and righteousness, and peace. Jesus' rule and reign is intended to give freedom and life to those who are in his kingdom. But Herod's rule and reign is very different. It was marked by selfishness, an ego, trying to build an empire to make a name for himself. It was characterized by oppression, using people in his kingdom to gain something, and it was characterized by violence. It says in the history books that anytime Herod felt a threat to his power or his throne, he would immediately get rid of people. So much so he, would, he killed a wife, and he killed two of his sons because he was worried that somehow they might come after him. Now, Herod and in, in his, his character in the story might seem disconnected from your life, right? You might say, well, I'm not a king in power. Like, I'm not really threatened by the presence of Jesus in my life. So Herod seems like somebody who's very disconnected. And maybe, maybe that's true. But I do think there's a core desire that we all have that is found in Herod as well. And that desire is the desire for control. Anybody here like control in their life? Oh, yeah, just a little bit. If you're not all raising your hand, you're a bunch of liars, right? <laughs> Man, we love control, right? And when our control seems to get out of our grasp, it can cause insecurity, it can cause fear, it can cause panic, it can cause anger. So a couple years ago, um, one of our daughters had just learned how to ride a bike. And she was using her sister's bike all the time. And this woman in our neighborhood said, hey, I've got an extra bike that I don't need anymore. My kids are grown out of the house. Would you like to have this bike for one of your daughters? And I was like, oh, yeah, that'd be great. So I tell Emma one evening, like, hey, we're going to go. Somebody's going to give you a bike, and we're going to go get it tomorrow. And her face lights up. She's so excited. She goes out on the sidewalk that night practicing again for the day that she's going to get her own bike. And so in the morning, we walk from our house 
to this woman's house, and by the time we get there, her garage door is open, the bike's there ready to go, and Emma is so excited. So we, you know, have a little small talk, exchange a few words, and then Emma's ready to go. She straps on her helmet, she straddles the bike, and off she goes. And I was expecting this moment to be so wonderful, like so magical to see the joy of this little child get their own bike, ride away with hair flowing out from underneath her helmet, getting smaller and smaller as she goes into the distance and looking back and just having this beaming face of joy. She goes about 10 yards, her feet slip off the pedals, she goes into the grass and loses control. Now thankfully, Like she's standing, so she doesn't fall over, but she's all twisted up in the bike, and I run up to her, and I'm determined, oh, we're going to overcome this. It's a small setback, no big deal. And I'm like, Emma, it's okay. Like this happens to people. You can do it. Let's try again. And she goes, no, I don't want to. I was like, no, 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 it's okay. You can do it. I know that you can. And she's like, "Uh uh-uh. I'm like, okay, so here's my plan. I strategize. I think to myself, let's just walk to the corner. We'll cross the street. It's a new block. We'll try again. And so she follows me. I'm like carrying her bike. She's whimpering and whining. And I assume that means she's on board with my plan. We get to the next block. I put the bike out. I'm like, here we go, Emma. And she goes, no, I don't want to. And I was like, oh, okay. So then I tell her, like, here's the deal. Like, I have a stroller because Lucy, our youngest, is there with me. And this bike that I'm holding, like, here's the deal. Like, if, if you don't ride your bike, like, you have to walk. Like, there aren't any other options. It's either ride the bike or walk. So let's try it again. And she goes, no. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And so then I tell her, I'm like, fine, then you have to walk. And then she says no to that. And so then my direction of walking now becomes a command. You will walk. And she continues to dig her heels in, and she's like, nah. uh And then my command turns to a threat. If you don't walk, when we get home, right, and she's just firmly planted on the sidewalk, not budging at all, and then I think, all right, I'm walking. Assuming that once I take those first few steps, she's going to chase after me. Dad, I'm so sorry. Come back. Don't leave me. And so I'm pushing the stroller. I got the bike in one hand. I take a few steps. She grabs the bike out of my hand and says, no. And I'm like, and I'm like starting to lose it. My blood is boiling and I'm just filled with rage. I sit down on the side. I'm like looking her in the eye. I'm like, you will, and we're going to, and it's gonna, and neighbors are starting to come out of their houses at this point. And I'm like, I'm toast. I've completely lost control of this five-year-old, and it's making me lose my mind. The, The only thing I could do is call Becky, get in the van, and get this hot mess back home, right? And it, like, I, I can still find myself in that place, like remembering how mad I was. Because when we love control, and we go for control, and we can't access that control, it sometimes causes us to feel helpless, powerless, lost, and insecure. Now, what's really interesting about this moment is it says that Herod was disturbed. But not only is Herod disturbed about this new king been born of the Jews, It says, in all of Jerusalem with him. And it raises the question, why? Like, why would they be disturbed? I get why Herod would be disturbed. He's king, and he still wants to be king. And then there's this new king. But why would all of Jerusalem be disturbed? Well, there's a pretty good chance that Herod has a reputation. And all of Jerusalem knows his reputation. That Herod's willing to kill his wife and two of his kids when he doesn't get what he wants. And so if there is a legit threat on his throne, that could mean huge trouble for our entire city. Because when people react out of insecurity and anger and rage takes over, they can leave a wake of destruction in their path and everybody else behind them is affected by it and has to clean it up. So Herod, his first response is that he is disturbed. His second response is that he investigates. We read this in verse 4. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, because remember, 
Herod isn't Jewish. Even though he has the title king of the Jews, he's not Jewish. Through a series of victorious battles and conquests and strategic alliances, he has found himself in charge in Jerusalem for the sake of Rome, reporting back to Rome about how he's keeping the peace of Rome in his city, but he's not Jewish. So he calls the religious leaders together to learn more about what their scriptures say about this baby and where he will be born and when, right? He asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Verse 5, in Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people. That's a quote from Micah 5, 2. So it's not uncommon for people to investigate Jesus and do so with one of two motivations. Sometimes people investigate Jesus because they are curious about him. Other times, people investigate Jesus because they are suspicious of him. You see this all through the New Testament, specifically in the Gospels, when the Pharisees are trying to understand who Jesus is. Their desire is to find a way to get rid of him and kill him. That's their motivation. They're suspicious about him. And even in our day today, too, people can be suspicious about Jesus. Is he really who who he says he is? Or are all these Christians just misguided? What I need to do is learn about Jesus so I can discredit him and still go live however I am choose. And so here in this moment, Matthew's writing his story in a way where you're not sure. Is Herod suspicious or curious? Because the, the very next verse, we see that Herod starts to scheme, but it takes a little while before his scheming really shows itself for what it is. Because in verse 7, it says this, then Herod called the Magi secretly, right? Finally connects with these mysterious figures from out of town, seeking this baby and following a star. And found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. So maybe Herod is curious. Maybe he really does want to learn about who Jesus is and what this means for him, his rule, and all of the empire. Maybe he is legitimately curious. But what Matthew does with this story is he puts the Magi and Herod side by side to show their responses and reactions to Jesus, to indicate how they are wildly different, and to present in front of us a choice. Like, how are we going to respond? How are we going to respond when insecurity comes our way, when we feel threatened, and we have the decision to follow Jesus? Because the Magi have two very different responses than Herod. And they come in this next section, starting in verse 9. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen, when it rose, went ahead of them, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There's two things we see in this next section the Magi do. The first is they come to worship. It's the thread that runs through this story. When they show up in Jerusalem and they ask the question, where is this king who's been born king of the Jews? We have come to worship him. And here they found him and their immediate response is to worship him. Now there's lots of different things that we could say about what worship is and how we engage in worship But for the sake of what's happening in this story, I think we could simply say that worship starts with being a response. A response specifically to who God is. Not even so much about what God has done, because in this moment, yes, God has sent this baby, but even in this moment, this baby hasn't done anything but is worthy of worship. Again, not because of what he has done, but simply because of who he is. That he is the king of kings, the true king of kings, the true Lord of lords, over all creation, in a humble, simple, stable. Worship is also about offering, about giving. How many times do we leave church and we reflect on how the service went 
and our response is, I just didn't really get anything out of it. I didn't connect with what, I mean, the songs that they sang were like my least favorite worship songs. Like I wasn't inspired by anything that guy said. Like it just didn't connect. I didn't get anything out of it, right? Like, so if that's our mindset, we leave church evaluating church based on how I felt about how it went, perhaps we're not asking the right question as we enter in. Are we coming in with a consumeristic mindset or are we coming to contribute, to specifically contribute to the worship that is taking place? Am I coming simply to receive? And you will receive, right? God has lots to offer, lots to say. He, he has encouragement for you. But if our main motivation is come just to just come and receive, it means we're missing the aspect of worship. It's also about coming to give, to offer. And at some level, that offering should be sacrificial in nature. These three men have traveled great distance with expensive gifts to pay homage and worship to this baby who will be a king that will change the course of human history. The Magi first come to worship. And then we see that the Magi obey. Verse 12, And after having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So five times in Matthew 1 and 2, there are five moments where people receive a message from the Lord through a dream. Three out of those five, it says that the Lord appeared to him. So in this moment, you don't have it saying the Lord appeared, but he's set this scene that any time there's a dream that directs somebody's action in these two chapters, it's a way that the Lord is prompting them to follow and obey the instructions that he's giving. And so here, the Magi hear this report. Herod says, come back and tell me where this baby is. The dream says, no, don't, and go another way home. And they follow and they obey. They obey the message from the dream. And so the question for us this morning is not only what's my posture and my attitude in coming into worship, but is God calling me to something? Am I being challenged by the Lord to obey, to follow, even if it seems risky? even if it seems like it's going to stretch me outside my comfort zone, even if it feels like it might cost me something. The Magi here respond in worship and obedience. And when you put those two things together, it's something we would call surrender. That they have fully surrendered themselves. They have acknowledged that there's something bigger than themselves And in contrast with Herod and how he's operating, this is a very different way to live. Because Herod's true colors come out at the beginning, at the end of this story. If we jump ahead to verse 16, this is what we receive, or this is what we read about what Herod does when he receives that these magi have not returned. It says in verse 16, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Like Herod knows. He knows he's lost. He knows he has no control. His power, his prestige, he can't intimidate these Magi. He can't scheme his way to get what he wants. He can't finesse and finagle them and manipulate them to come back. He has lost. And the only thing he knows how to do is to incite a genocide of baby boys. He has lost control completely. And the irony of it all is that Herod dies a few years later, right? He lives into his 70s, which is pretty old in the ancient world, dies a few years later, dies before Jesus will ever even be a teenager. Meaning that while the news of this baby was good news for the world and bad news for Herod, it wasn't a true threat because it wouldn't be but a few more decades before Jesus ever steps into his public ministry and makes an impact that way. Herod has no sight of the long term. He's just scared out of his mind in the short term. And what this captures for us, for how we navigate moments when we feel insecure and threatened is we do it through surrender. Surrender overcomes 
insecurity. See, we all have insecurities in our life, right? We all have things about our performance or this perception of how people might view us or am I good enough or am I smart enough? We, we all have insecurities in our life. And oftentimes our paradigm is the way I overcome my insecurities is through trying harder, doubling down, working harder so that I can impress other people, so that people can actually see how good or capable I am. If I work hard and I'm diligent enough, I can overcome the things that cause me fear and insecurity. And the gospel says, no, it, it doesn't happen through performance. It doesn't happen through per perception of others. Insecurity, overcoming insecurity happens through surrender. Like giving your life fully to Jesus, trusting, again, his identity, his performance, his power in your life, not feeling like you have to muster it up on your own. Because when you create your own power, you maintain it by trying to push everybody away. But when you give it up and lay it down, you find that it's actually Jesus working in and through you. And so the question is how? Like, how do we practice that? How do we actually do that? How do we step into that surrender in order to overcome insecurities? Well, in that staff meeting with our children's ministry director and my buddy Jeff, I found myself instantly feeling threatened by Jeff because he was preaching that Sunday and I wasn't. And I needed to figure out how to outwit him and outperform him so people saw me over him. And I went home that night and for the next week, week and a half, like, every time I interacted with him, every time I thought of him, like, this narrative was going in my head. What do I have to do to maintain control? What do I have to do to position myself and posture myself so that people see me over him? And it was just this wearing me out, this narrative in my head that was just wearing me out. And I realized somewhere along the way that if I don't break this cycle, it will drive me into the ground. So the first thing I had to do was name it. I had to name it for what it is. It was insecurity and it was fear because I was trying to be the master of my own destiny. And so I said to myself, here's what I have to do. I have to go in tomorrow and I have to tell Jeff what's going on. So I was like, hey, Jeff, can you come into my office? Can we sit down? Can we talk? He's like, oh, yeah, sure. And I said, hey, so I, I just need to tell you this. Like for the last week and a half, I've been competing with you. And he's like, really? I mean, just oblivious to it. Because he's such a nice guy. Like, such a nice guy. He's like, I had no idea. I'm like, I know, because it's all internal. I've had this narrative going on in my head. And, and I just need to tell you this. So I stopped feeding the beast. And I can move on. And then what began to happen in the months ahead is that the church actually asked both of us to co-pastor the church for the next season, which would have been three or four years before I came here. And it was one of the best seasons of ministry I had because it was so formidable in learning how to work alongside somebody who couldn't have been more different than me and teach me all sorts of things about patience, about prayer, about working in partnership with people. Like God knew exactly what he was doing. And so when I step into something with surrender and I name my insecurity, it gives me an opportunity to trust, to trust God. And in that place, experience rest. Because if I'm striving to maintain control and power, that's a whole lot of work and it's not very restful. But when I surrender and I let it go and I lay it down, it's me posturing myself in a way to say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. And then we do the same thing that the Magi are doing. We pursue Jesus because that's what they're doing. They're pursuing Jesus. They've gone from one side of the world to the other, following this star to pursue Jesus. And when they get there, they worship him. It's this declaration of like, I'm giving my life to you so I can experience the rest that you have for me. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so this Christmas, where are you experiencing insecurity? Has anybody popped into your head over the last 30 minutes, who feels like a threat to you. Maybe your relationship with them is not such that you should go name for them, that you feel that they're a threat. 
that you feel insecure, but maybe you need to tell somebody and they can ask you about it and walk with you as hopefully you grow in strength, not in your own strength, but in the Lord's strength working in and through you. And may you find that rest comes your way. So may you see that your insecurities are actually a pathway to Jesus. May you rest in the love that he has for you, and may it cause you to worship him with everything that you have. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for what you have done for us in and through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his sacrificial death and how he has modeled for us what it means to be fully surrendered to you. Lord, we, we confess that, that we are people who go our own way. We are people who are riddled with insecurities, that we are people who need you in our life to guide us moment by moment. And so, Lord, we ask that in this place, as we step into this last moment of this service, we would open our hands up, that we would lay our lives down. We would lay down our fears and our worries and our concerns, and that we'd be able to pick up the peace and the rest that you offer through giving everything else over to you. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in your name. Amen.